Thank you for that special and that uh, great reminder to take each day, day by day, and with each passing moment. Strength I find to meet my trials there. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. And what a wonderful, blessed truth that hymn has. Of course, the scriptures are, are full of wonderful promises about our thoughts, and, and we'll be concluding tonight in this portion of Stewarding Life in this series of our thoughts. As, as we look at Philippians chapter 4, let's um, read Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 4, if you'd follow along as I read. Uh, through verse number 8 here, the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Well, how do we handle stressful times? Certainly, um, 2021 has been, um, I guess, really no different than 2020 as far as when it comes to stress and anxiety, especially in the political scene here in America today. Um, how do we handle stress? How do we handle anxiety? How do we handle thoughts of fear of the future or even of the present? Um, things that will happen this upcoming week that uh, we may be slightly aware of and maybe um, news, or report, or whatever the case may be. Um, we really need to, if we're going to handle stress, if we're going to handle anxious thoughts biblically, then we need to really have a change in our thinking process. Uh, as we've talked about in these uh, sermons on renewing our thoughts as far as um, stewarding life, uh, we need to renew our thoughts through Scripture. And uh, stewarding our thoughts is really the process of learning to think biblically. In verse number 4, Paul said, Rejoice, Lord, always. Again, I say rejoice. And we are challenged to think with praise. The object of our praise is not our circumstance, but the object of our praise is the God of all circumstances, the one who never changes. And we need to focus on the goodness of the Lord. And the opportunity to praise is always, at all times. We have opportunities both in the good and the bad. So we are to think with praise. And, and the whole thought of Philippians 4, 4 through 8 is, okay, here's five thoughts or five prescriptions that we as believers can use to help us think biblically in stressful times. So when stressful times, and regardless if it's stressful time or not, we should always be thinking with praise. Secondly, thinking with poise. Verse 5 says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, that sweet disposition, that mildness, that gentle spirit, how can we have poise, not only in difficult circumstances, but with um, our enemies, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil going against us? Well, we can have poise as we rest in the security of God. So many times, especially in the Psalms, the psalmist David says, wait on the Lord. And it's in those times of waiting that we can rest and we can have that poise. And then not only rest in his security, but rest in his sovereignty. God sees you. God knows you. He knows what you need, and he's promised to supply and to meet that need, and he's always good. And then two Sundays ago, I believe, we shared the thought from verse number 6, thinking with prayer. Thinking with prayer. Verse 6, be careful for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Uh, request without worry and request with thanksgiving. Now, as we prepare to take a look at our um, fourth prescription, that is thinking with peace, if you would, turn it with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Uh, the book of Daniel many times is an intimidating book because of the prophecy that's, that's found within it. Uh, but I also love, the, especially the first six chapters of Daniel. There is prophecy in the first six chapters, 
but also there's some just real practical truths that that you and I as believers can can grab a hold of and can be an encouragement to us as Daniel and and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced trials of their faith. And in, in Daniel chapter 6, it's talking about King Darius, and it's talking about how it, it talks about the order of his kingdom and how throughout his kingdom he had 120 princes, verse 1. And of the 120 princes, there were three presidents, verse 2, that were set up over the 120 prince, princes. And of those three presidents, Daniel was the first. And the reason why Daniel was preferred above the two other presidents was because the Bible says that there was found an excellent spirit in him. Well, so it is with our human nature. We tend to get jealous, don't we, at the success of others, at the blessings of others. And even that can creep into our Christian homes and even churches, uh, a jealous, envious spirit. Uh, certainly that's not a spirit that honors the Lord. And yet uh, these presents and these princes were, were jealous because Daniel was preferred over them. And so they sought an occasion against him. And so they kind of set some spies out and they watched him and they observed him. And think about that. You know, if someone were to try, a, try a, excuse me, if someone were to try to find a fault in your life or my life, and if they were underneath careful watch and observance, could they find a, a fault of which they could lay accusation upon? Well, they looked for Daniel, and they couldn't find anything. And the thing that came to their mind was, you know, unless we find something against his faith, and if we can find something at fault against him, his faith, because he's so consistent, in every area of his life, and his faith, it seems, is the most important thing to his life. And so they came up with this decree that they were going to get King Darius to sign, that for the next 30 days, if anyone prayed to any other god or man except for the king, then he would be thrown into the den of lions. And by the way, these, these presidents and these princes that came to the king uh, they were very deceitful. They were dishonest. We've consulted amongst all of them, which they hadn't. They hadn't consulted with Daniel, who was first. And certainly the king showed poor discernment in not consulting Daniel, as Daniel was not there. And so the king signed the decree. It's unalterable. And then Daniel chapter 6, in verse number 9, Wherefore King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed... Think about that. Just put it real practical where you and I live. Whether it wants to be a den of lions or a den of snakes or a den of your most fearful animal. You know, it might as well be a lion. But the decree that if, if we as believers were to pray to any other God or to any other man except for, let's say, the President of the United States, then we'd be cast in the den of your worst nightmare whatever that may be, would there be some fearful, anxious thoughts that would begin to arise? Look at verse 10 again. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. You know, Philippians 4 6 was eternally already written in heaven. But Daniel's a great demonstration of that. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, thinking, that, thinking this through, I mean, would there have been anything wrong for him to, instead of opening his window, going into, I think there's a verse in the New Testament that says, go into your closet and pray in your clo pro cl the closet secretly. And your heavenly Father, which seeth you secretly, shall reward you openly. It's a paraphrase. But Daniel was not intimidated. He wasn't fearful. It's because his thoughts were fixed upon his God. 
And he took those thoughts to his Lord in prayer. Verse 11, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying, making supplication before his God. So Daniel chose to pray and to give thanks, even in a very difficult time. Well, the the presidents brought the report of Daniel to the king, and the king was certainly disturbed, realized he'd been tricked, but realized that he could not change the decree. Verse number 14, Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled on the king and said to the king, Now, O king, know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake unto spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Now Daniel, when the decree was made, I believe instead of fearful thoughts, now he, he may have been concerned a little bit, But he didn't dwell or allow the fear or the anxiety to cripple him. And so he prayed and gave thanks and prayed to the Lord Jehovah. When he was cast in the lion den, now the English translation doesn't tell us, but in the Hebrew I think it does say that he used a a lion for a pillow. And, And he slept soundly, probably had one of the best. Now, that's all in the Hebrew, okay? You can't see it right there in the English. I'm, I'm joking about that. But, but I believe that just as Daniel, when he prayed, knowing the decree, had perfect peace, in the den of lions, I believe he had perfect peace there in the den of lions. But notice the king. In verse number 18, Then the king went to his palace, and passed the night fasting, neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. What a contradiction. The king in his palace with abundance, complete worldly security, but yet he was totally insecure. He was up all night. Daniel in the den of lions, I believe, had a great sound night of sleep. It just goes to show that what the world seeks to bring peace and security and happiness and fulfillment and freedom from anxiety and fear and worry, it doesn't work. And and we know from the rest of the chapter that God delivered Daniel from the lion's den. So when it comes to fearful thoughts, when it comes to stressful times in your life and my life, we need to choose, and it's a choice, to think with praise. Rejoice, Lord, always. Again, I say rejoice. To think with poise. Let your moderation be known unto all men, for the Lord is at hand. He's here. He knows. And then think with prayer. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And then we see, um, if you have your handout from a few weeks ago, it's Roman numeral 2, thinking with peace. Thinking with peace. Paul Chapel says, in the midst of chaos, God extends peace, which is the most needful commodity for our circumstances. What we think is that we need a change in our circumstance. We think that we need a repair of a relationship or escape from an emergency. And sometimes God does choose to do that. Whatever God chooses, we must realize that there is available for the believer peace because of God's promises in the midst of our, of our problems. When we are challenged to think with peace, first of all, we need to understand that there is a heavenly design. There's a heavenly design. The Bible talks about two kinds of peace, peace with God and the peace of God. Peace with God comes at salvation, Romans 5.1, therefore being justified 
by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And peace with God is certainly just the beginning. And certainly it is a very important beginning to not be at enmity or at war with God anymore, but to have peace in our hearts and peace knowing that our eternal destiny is secure. And it's not based upon anything that we have done or will continue to do, but it's based upon what Christ has done for us and that we've trusted Christ as our Savior. But not only is there peace with God, but there is the peace of God. And that's what it says here in verse number eight, 7 of Philippians 4. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that peace is available when we keep our hearts and minds fixed upon Christ. He calms and steadies our emotions. Isaiah 26 and verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Just as it's a choice to think with praise and poise and prayer, so it's a choice for us to think with peace, fixing our heart upon the promises of God. Paul Chappell shares an illustration about many World War heroes that spent a good portion of the war confined in concentration camps, being interrogated and mercilessly tortured. There is one such man by the name, he was a German pastor by the name of, and I'll just say his first name, Martin. And he was imprisoned because he opposed the Nazi state control of the churches. Pastor Martin was imprisoned in two of the most infamous German concentration camps, In these and other dark, depraved concentration camps, indescribable scenes of unspeakable torture and violent execution were common. After Pastor Martin's release, he wrote concerning the sustaining power of Scripture. What did this book mean to me during the long, weary years of solitary confinement and then for the last four years at Dacha? The Word of God was simply everything to me. Comfort and strength, guidance and hope, master of my days and companion of my nights, the bread which kept me from starvation, and the water of life that refreshed my soul. And what part of the word of what part does the word of God play in your life and my life when we go through a crisis? Many times, it's sad to say that it's not until later on in the crisis that the Word of God begins to play a vital part in our response. Many times it's because we're responding in our own strength and our own wisdom or, or the wisdom of this world instead of seeking God's help through His Word. And yet, we think about the promises of God in His Word and the peace that He has promised. So there's a heavenly design when we're thinking with peace. There's peace with God that comes at salvation, but there's the peace of God. Capital B, there's also a helpful design. You think about Satan's attack against our mind. You think about his weapons. Doubt. He casts doubt upon the word of God. He casts doubt upon the the goodness of God. God's holding out on you. You could be having such a much better life if you did your own thing. Despair, hopelessness, frustration, fear, being overwhelmed, worry, anger. And, and you think about the arsenal that Satan has, you're like, yeah, I, I can identify with at least one, if not all of those. And... and And the devil has used those in my life personally as well. But yet, God gives us a defense. Notice in this verse, verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds. The the words shall keep is a military term meaning shall mount guard. God's peace is not something that's dormant. It's not just an emotional luxury available to simply make us feel better. But it is an active release of God's power to guard our minds from Satan's onslaught. 
Warren Wiersbe says this, the peace of God stands guard over two areas, two area, two areas that create worry and anxiety. Our heart, which is wrong feeling, and our mind, which is wrong thinking. Colossians 3.15, and the peace of God rule in your hearts. So think, think about the peace of God. God has designed for that to keep a guard over our hearts and our minds. How many times have you and I got into trouble because we responded by the wrong emotion or by the wrong thoughts? And we just spoke upon what was on our mind. Or we spoke how our heart felt. And yet God's peace has been designed by him to set a mount, to set a guard about our thoughts and our emotions. Paul Chappell said, This weapon is released as we make the decision to obey God's directive to let his peace rule in our hearts. His peace provides health and protection to our hearts and minds, but we must give it the liberty to rule our thinking. Again, Daniel's a great example of this. When the decree was made, what did he do? He gave thanks, he made supplication, and he had perfect peace in the midst of difficulty. How do we handle stress, anxiety, fear, worry? We think with praise, we think with poise, we think with prayer, we think with peace. Then lastly, verse 8, we see we think with purity. We think with purity. Verse 8 says this, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. There's a few things that I can cook. Um, I can cook macaroni and cheese. I, I can grill a lot of things, which I, I like to grill. That's, that's kind of easy, and you just marinate the meat in something, and marinade makes meat taste that much better, and you just don't offer it as a burnt sacrifice. You kind of have it a, a little bit tender. And the, the, Growing up, we had burnt sacrifices every time the grill was fired up, and the only thing to make it taste good was a lot of ketchup. But um, um, one of the things that I can cook is spaghetti. And uh, spaghetti, of course, if um, I, I like meat, I like sauce, and I like cheese. None of those are, and noodles, those, and bread, and cheese, if I mention cheese. None of those things are really helpful and healthy for you. But uh, when making spaghetti, I use a strainer for two things, and maybe you use them for more, but I just use them for two. One is for the noodles, when you boil the noodles, and then you pour the, the pot of of hot water with the noodles through the strainer, and you keep all the noodles, right? So all the water runs out. Um, depending upon the quality of the meat that you got, when you ground it, um, there's going to be grease in there, right? Now, if you want to eat a little healthier, you want to get rid of the grease, right? And so what do you do? You put that meat with the grease through the strainer, and you let all the grease come out. Then you don't you don't use the grease for something else in cooking. You, you, know, you dispose of it, right? Well, in essence, that strainer is what God desires for his word and for his promises to be a filter for you and I as we think. And so he kind of gives us this checklist when it comes to thinking with purity. First of all, we see capital A, the description of pure thoughts. The description of pure thoughts uh, Paul Chappell says, we may not be able to control some of the external pressures or stresses in our lives, but we can choose what thoughts we allow to take hold of our minds. And so God gives us the, this checklist to go through. Again, verse 8, finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good report? So this is what I am to filter my mind through when it comes to my thinking. If I am going to have victory over stress and anxiety and fear and worry, 
then I'm going to go through this checklist because I'm going to th- I want to think pure thoughts. So here we see, first of all, what sort of things are true. Loving the truth, speaking the truth, truth and character. Uh, one commentator did a survey, and the survey was done, and it said 8% of things people worry about are legitimate. The other 92% are imaginary, they will never happen, or they are things that they will have no control over. Think about that. How much time do we spend in our thoughts thinking about things that are not true? I'm guilty of a lot of times imagining and thinking up scenarios that have no basis of truth. And according to God's word, if I am going to have victory over that, I need to think pure thoughts. And so if I'm thinking pure thoughts, I want to think true thoughts. Getting rid of those those imaginations that have no basis and no truth. Then we come to the next word, honest. The word honest has to be, has, you, has to, means to be venerated for character, honorable. The word just means righteous, upright, approved of God. Pure means free from carnality, chaste, modest, clean. The word lovely, acceptable, pleasing, winsome, amiable, of good report, sounding well, highly regarded, well thought of. If we start going through this filter, and all of a sudden, we realize that many of the thoughts that come into our minds will be eliminated. And I don't know about you, but I need all the brain power I have. I need to keep as much as I have to think right thoughts and not drain myself on wrong thinking. Thoughts that would tear down myself or others or God. So we've seen the description of the pure thoughts in this checklist, this filter to go through. But capital B, the development of pure thoughts. How does this happen? Well, it says there afterwards, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So the, the development of pure thoughts comes with my thinking. It's a deliberate choice that I choose to cast out the imaginations to allow God and his word and the spirit of God and Lord Jesus Christ to cast down imaginations and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of, of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Instead of focusing so much on those thoughts that are not truthful, that are not honest, that are not just, that are not of good report, I start thinking upon thoughts such as God's word and meditating upon his promises and upon his character and upon his goodness. That's where my focus needs to be, not upon the thoughts of fearfulness. We must choose to examine the thoughts that enter our minds. So if we're going to do that, there are probably some decisions that need to be made. I can remember one time, um, I, I, and I, I won't, it, it's a Christian author, but I picked up a, a Christian book, and um, I started reading the book, and I couldn't put it down, and I read it all night long. And I was, I, I mean, it, it, was, it was a fairly good book, but it was kind of a scary book, too. I mean, it, it, it had a, a Christian message in it, but it was, it was a scary book. And part of the reason why I couldn't put it down is because I didn't want to go to sleep because of the fearful thoughts that the book was generating. And I was so fixated on that book. You know what happened the next day? <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't fall asleep. Well, I probably <laughs> took a cat nap or two. But I was basically worthless. And it's all because of what 
I was feeding my mind what I was thinking upon. Now, I understand that there's, there's good books out there and you can read them and, and they wouldn't cause fear or anything like that, but just like I preached that message too much of a good thing several years ago in the fire station, I, cashews are good, but I ate a whole can of cashews. It was in my stocking, and I suffered for it for the next couple of days because I ate it all in one sitting. And you know... When it comes to your life and my life, we need to be careful about our thoughts, what we are fixating ourselves upon. So it may mean that we need to put down a book after an hour, two. It may mean that I need to turn off a television show. I can remember that there was a, it was a, a show... It was a true story about these these um, people. I don't know why you'd want to do this, but they would they would go crawling in caves and like crawl in real tight places that you'd have to like you know exhale all your oxygen to squeeze through to get to the next cavern. And I can remember it was Case and I were watching it, and it was like nine o'clock at night. And I was like, I mean, I am claustrophobic. So tight places, it just, it gets to me. And here I am watching this, this movie, and I'm having problems breathing. I'm sitting on the couch or on the recliner. I mean, I've got all the room, all the oxygen in the world, but I'm having problems breathing. And I finally told Casey, Casey, you can let me know how this ends up tomorrow, but I, gotta, I can't watch this anymore. It was affecting me. You know, sometimes we wonder, why is it that I'm having such a problem with the fear and the anxiety and the worry? It's because of what we're thinking about. And we're constantly engaged in things that are not true that are not honest, that are not lovely, that are not of good report, that are not virtuous. And that's where our minds are fixated upon. And you can, you can go in all sorts of different directions. And I won't mention specifics. I've just mentioned a few, a book and a movie for me personally. But I believe the Spirit of God can tell you what it is for you. And it may be that you need to turn something off. You need to unplug something. It may be that that relationship is just toxic. Because whenever you're in the presence of that individual, your thoughts are just ungodly. Your thoughts just go in the gutter. Your thoughts are full of fear and worry. Your thoughts are full of hatred and anger. And so there's some tough decisions that need to be made if we're going to commit to thinking biblically. Paul Chappell says, mental discipline doesn't come easily, but it does simplify our lives. Do you want to have freedom of a renewed mind? It comes with thinking. Thinking on those thoughts that honor the Lord. Well, in our three-part series on stewarding thoughts, we've seen the importance of thinking with praise, thinking with poise, thinking with prayer, thinking with peace, and thinking with purity. We've got a lot to think upon, don't we? We've got a lot to apply, apply to our hearts and lives. But the result is rest, is peace, is joy, is security. If we have peace with God, let's enjoy the peace of God as he has intended that to keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's close in prayer. God, we thank you for uh, these truths that we've looked at from Philippians chapter 4. And God, I ask that you'd help us to fixate our thoughts 
on things that are true, honest, lovely, and of good report. Father, help us to be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known unto you. God, help us to have peace because we know that you are on the throne, that you are at hand. Help us to rejoice always because we're rejoicing in you. And you're always good and you always do what is best for us. God, may we go in a, a state of constant victory. Help us to be vigilant. Help us to set up that to allow you to set up that guard over our thoughts for our mind and our emotions for our heart. We ask that you'd bless us as we dismiss. God, may, may this week, may we choose with each day that you give us tonight, may we choose to walk in the light as we looked at this morning. And God, may we choose to think with praise and with poise and with prayer and with peace and with purity. We ask for your blessing as we dismiss. And God, I thank you for the opportunity that we um, had to see Katya today. And God, I pray that you bless her as she travels back to Pensacola and prepares for the conclusion of her junior semester. And we just thank you for how you have been faithful in her life. And God, we pray that you continue to provide and to meet her every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great night.